And welcome back to the second session of the Frank Church Symposium. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce my new young friend, Fahim Rahim. In fact, it gives me very great pleasure to be able to introduce anybody of my age. <laughs> Dr. Rahim comes from a small town on the Persian Gulf, Karachi, Pakistan by name. It only has about 30 times the number of people that are contained in the entire state of Idaho. He graduated from Aga Khan University Medical College, also in Karachi. His residency training was completed at Westchester Medical Center in New York City, where he was awarded excellence in training and best resident for two years. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Society of Nephrology. Together <coughs> with his brother Naeem, they own and operate the Idaho Kidney Institute with offices in Pocatello, Blackwood, and Idaho Falls, where they take care of all manner of uh, patients with renal diseases. Uh, they are the first Idahoans <coughs> to receive the Ellis Island Medical Medal of Honor, which is given yearly by the National Ethnic Coalition of Organizations, NECL paying homage to the immigrant experience and contributions made by immigrants and their children. Other recipients of this award include, uh, and there's a lot of them, Yogi Berra, Joe Maggio, Bob Holt, Frank Sinatra, Jane Seymour, Rosa Parks, and Henry Kissinger, plus a couple of past presidents, and even Donald Trump. You want to give a <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> he, he and his wife have two beautiful children. He is fluent in English, Hindi, Urdu, and Punjabi, and has become an outdoor enthusiast uh, since he moved to Pocatello. His foundation and entrepreneurship are already legendary. Uh, think of his work after the big earthquake in Nepal. In addition, he is a member of the Rotary Club of Pocatello, and so with all of this, he must be spread rather thin, and when I look at him, I'm sure that he is. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for your kind introduction. I just uh, wish that you were present at my wedding, because there's no one to introduce me, <laughs> except for my brother, he did a pretty terrible job. <laughs> And he was supposed to be here. I don't think he showed up. He's probably still asleep. Um, well, I'm really excited about today's talk because um, something that's really dear to me, something that I've learned over the last many years of doing a lot of relief work in many parts of the world. Um, I'm a kidney doctor. That's my day job. Um, but when I'm not working on kidneys, I'm working on this, which is my passion. Um, my talk is mostly geared about my experiences in multiple disaster relief efforts that I've spent over the last few years. Um, so I came up with this topic, which is how do we create sustainable ecosystems in post-disaster communities which are fairly remote, fairly rural? Um, what is the key element? After doing a lot of back and forth and, and spending a lot of time, I realized the key to all of this is women empowerment especially the women who are living in those communities, because they get marginalized uh, for a multitude of reasons. Most of the f uh, pictures that you're going to see in this presentation were taken either by myself or my team members on multiple of our trips. This is one of my favorite photographs of these women who are sitting, waiting during one of our medical camps in um, a small place called Nagarkot, which is about 30, 40 miles uh, minutes out of uh, Kathmandu. So I don't know if anyone here is from Kathmandu, but they'll, they'll know the area very well. So, let me be the first to accept that men really don't know much about women, do we? <laughs> and I've been married for 17 years, and I'm so glad my wife is present while I'm making this claim to myself, but I came across this book that was written 100 years ago, and many of you who are married or intend to get married should get a copy of this, okay? <laughs> So it was written in 1913. I'm just going to read the first paragraph and how it relates to what we're going to talk about. So uh, Blanche writes, My dear sir, 
You are neither as bad nor as good as a fellow as you imagine yourself to be. No doubt you know a good deal about women, not nearly as much you will in another decade. And that's happened to me, for sure. <laughs> I've been married for over a decade. Now, post-disaster communities that we visited um, were earthquakes, floods, wars, internally and externally displaced people, uh, four different regions of the world where I had presence directly or indirectly were in Nepal after the earthquake in a district called Sindhupalcho. In Chitral in Pakistan, which is the northern, extreme north part of Pakistan, close to the Afghan border, first with flooding and then with earthquake in the last six months. Then Calais, France, I don't know if, uh, how many of you know about Calais, it's also called the jungle, which has um, been there for the last 10 years, is uh, first off for a multitude of uh, multiple refugees who flee from different parts of the world, from Iraq to Afghanistan to Syria now, and they end up on this, uh, this small town across the channel from UK. And then uh, my another experience was very <coughs> unique actually in one of the slums in Bangkok um, of a small kind of an orphanage daycare center of what, what I think is, is kind of a socially marginalized community of children which is the Rama 8. Now, the group that always gets more most affected by most of these disasters, whether it's natural or man-made war, earthquake or flooding, is always women and children are the, under the age of five. Um, and they happen to be marginalized, not only socially, but financially, health-wise, and many other reasons. These are some of the pictures of one of the medical camps that I did in very close to a one sun border in a very remote part of Valley of Chitral, beautiful valley um, called Mastuj. Now some of these people also, I don't know if many of you have heard of a place called Kalash. Kalash is a very small valley and if you ever get a chance, if you remember this, Google it after my talk later in the day, Kalash Valley, and you'll see some starking images of these very small community who lives very remotely. There are about three, four thousand people who are considered to be descendants of Alexander the Great. Uh, I mean, I mean, look at these kids. I mean, they look more like your kids than my kids, right? I mean, they are blue-eyed, fair-skinned, very remote communities who've been living in the same environment for thousands of years. Now, what seems to be the biggest problem for a lot of these communities? Um, well. They're never able to get back on their feet, and I've gone back and forth multiple times. We've delivered hundreds of thousands of uh, material and supplies and, and goods for disaster relief because uh, we are very energized to do so. Um, we happily spend billions of dollars in post-disaster relief, and I'll show you some examples of how we did it and what we've done. But then what happens? Well, we forget about them. You know? How many of you still think every day about what happened in Nepal earthquake? In, on April 25th, or in Pakistan on October 25th. You know, it stays in the news and certainly it kind of dies off. There always seems to be an element of la lack of long-term initiative in these areas. You know, we go in with millions or even billions of dollars of goods, but very few people remain who want to interact in a long-term way to change the lives of those people. In the end, this whole cycle of relief effort truly becomes, makes me feel good. And I'm, I'm one of the, I, I, I will be the first to claim, yes, it made me feel good to be there. You know, there, we, we helped somebody on the ground, we gave them tents, we gave them food, but there's more to it. And, and this is a picture that, that we took, that's my brother, um, whose hand is on the shoulder of this, this poor guy who we're giving this tent to, and I'm sitting in the back, we all got a smile on our faces. But that poor guy is, you know, I mean, look at his impression, right? Right? He's like in, in an hour shock moment right now. Now, the two main issues with these communities that face long term are health care and education, especially for women and children under the age of five that we talked about. So I'm going to briefly touch on both of these topics. And in those topics, I'm going to kind of give you a different um, point of view. Let's take healthcare first. Okay, it's a very wide topic. Healthcare spans multiple different ideas and processes. But what do you think is one of the most dangerous events in a human being's life cycle? 
I, I heard some of you say that. Yes, it's childbirth. Okay, and anytime we think of childbirth, we think it's a women's problem. It's a female event that a woman has to go through. But truly, men have the same stake in this process as women do, and probably equal. Okay, we go through this as a husband when our wife's going through labor. We go through it ourselves as a son of a mother who's giving birth to us. Okay. So this becomes a very imminent problem for men that we don't realize we have pretty much almost 50% stake, if not more. Now back in 1930s, um, childbirth used to be very different. Even in the USA, a thousand women would die during 100,000 births, okay, which was one in 100. Now it's 18, roughly 18 to 19 deaths per 100,000 women in USA, which is still a big number, considering what you're gonna see next. In Japan and most of the developed world, it's about close to five per 1,000 births. Now this is a graph which will show you something shocking. Can any of you kind of get the point on this graph? Just raise your hands. Right, yeah? I mean, the developed world, the maternal mortality is going down, mostly followed by Germany, Japan, and Britain, while we've kind of gone up in a different direction. It's not the absolute numbers, but it's the direction that's concerning. There are multiple reasons for that. Some of the reasons are women are giving birth later in their life. And we are having more complicated medical problems like you know lupus, diabetes, hypertension when they're going through this process. And we are also getting more better at collecting data. But regardless of the reasons, we are moving in a different direction than the rest of the world, which seems to be the case in many things. Now, when we take the same statistics and look at some other countries around the world, the numbers are even more drastically different. I mean, thinking about 18 deaths per 100,000 in the USA versus 260 in Pakistan or India or Nepal or double the amount in Afghanistan. Now, this even gets more startling when we take the sub-Saharan and African subcontinent. Imagine 1,000 women per 100,000, and in South Sudan, it's up to 2,000, which is twice the amount where USA was 100 years ago. Now, this is ironic and this is tragic because it shouldn't be the case. <clears throat> the reason why it shouldn't be the case is because the technology, the information, and the travel, and nothing is any different. Those parts of the world is not, not out of our reach. It's just because of simple lack of intervention on our part as the community of the world, why these numbers are still high. It's just from the fact that we've just forgotten about this problem and many regions of the world is why the numbers are so high. So that was about education and some of these post-disaster relief <coughs> areas. Let's just, I mean about healthcare, let's talk about education. When we talk about education, we always think about books, schools, literacy, things like that. The, 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 the community that really gets affected the most in these post-disaster communities are actually girls. Because they were affected even before the disaster struck those communities. So if, you have, if you're a family with limited resources and you have a choice to send your, your son versus your daughter to school, guess what choice you're gonna make? And I've seen it myself, when they make these choices, the problem is that a lot of these communities, the way the community has evolved or the world has evolved in that part of the world, the return of investment on them sending their son to school to them seems a lot more than the return of investment on sending their girl to school. Because you know she's gonna get married, she's gonna get to go away, whatever be the case, they just don't think it that way which we know is not true. Now the education, at the same time, doesn't always mean books, because it also means opportunities, confidence, progress, health, economics, and above all, self-worth. 
So when you hold a girl back from education, you're not only holding her back from reading the books, but you're holding her back from all of these things. That has a huge impact in the future of a community and a nation and generations. So, before we move further on into my talk and, and we, we talk more specifics about what the solution is, I'm going to walk you through some of those communities where we've worked in the past. I haven't, I haven't been to Haiti, but I wanted to mention Haiti because it's an amazing example of all the disaster effort and what happens after that. So 220,000 people died. We almost spent $13.5 billion in Haiti. Their GDP is lower than it was before the earthquake. The area is not on their feet. You know, this is a picture of a family behind the tarp in their home where a house stood five years ago when the earthquake struck. And this is five years later and $14 billion later. And this is not an isolated example. There are a multitude of examples of a multitude of things. There are also examples in Haiti how cholera spread, which wasn't there earlier, but spread when the relief teams came in from different parts of the world running around with their sleeves rolled up, wanting to do good but not very well prepared and well equipped. Nepal, where I was, 8,000 people died, but not many people know that 50,000, 50% 50 more households were destroyed in Nepal compared to Haiti. What happened to the $4.2 billion of aid that came to them, or we, we was put in, this is a picture of a school where we did a medical camp and a small educational camp ourselves six months after the earthquake and the $4.2 billion. There are multiple areas of similar examples all over the country. That's another village where the kids have been out of school since the earthquake in one of the villages that we went to. This is a monastery that was demolished after the earthquake had just been finished right before the earthquake and the rubble still was there five or six months later when we visited that. Let's talk about Pakistan, the recent earthquake in October. You know, we went in there, our teams went in from Bogotelo. We spent a lot of time and effort and resources. We provided to 350 families with tents, food, shelter, the basic needs in this extremely remote part of the world, which looked just like this um, two months after the earthquake because of the, the winter coming in. This is how these people were at that time when, when the disaster struck. These some of the pictures from from our team that were taken on the ground. I mean, obviously not much resources even during winter. <coughs> this is a picture of one of the medical camps that we did. My brother was sitting here. We did it in the Kenna camp and <coughs> we honestly had no idea how many people would show up. Uh, we were expecting 30, 40, 50 people. 450 people walked through our clinic. In, next, in six or seven hours while we were there. And most of them were women and children.